Well, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College, and I'm here today uh, with Marty Blazer. Thank you very much, Marty. Can you Thank just, you for coming. Uh, my pleasure. It's nice to be here in your office. Um, can you give us, just in a very quick, uh, in your own words, your background? Uh, your, what, what do you do here at Rutgers University? Yeah. So I'm a medical doctor. I trained as a doctor. I trained in internal medicine and then infectious diseases. Uh, but then somewhere along the way I became a scientist uh, in microbiology. Uh, first I started studying pathogens that are bugs that are bad and, and then gradually I morphed into bugs that are sometimes bad, sometimes good, and then bugs that are good. And here at Rutgers I'm directing the Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine. Great. Um, You've written a book, which uh, many of us have read. It's very important for the conference we're having at Bard, Missing Microbes, How the Overuse of Antibiotics is Fueling Our Modern Plagues. Um, and the thesis, one thesis of the book, is that we're increasingly, microbes are disappearing. And, and as you said, most people have seen these microbes in a negative light, as pathogens of some sort. Yes. But the work you're involved in is suggesting that these microbes are actually also you're not contesting that. There are microbes that are pathogenic, yeah. that are evil, yeah. but there's some that are important. Sure. And so, so the microbes that cause cholera and plague and tuberculosis, th these are bad germs, and we've made a lot of progress in reducing them, but still not eliminating them. And then there are microbes that appear to be very beneficial for us, that, they, that we need them to make our vitamins and to help us digest food and to program our immune system. And then there are ones in the middle that sometimes are bad and sometimes are good. Okay, and so then to continue the question you were asking, the missing or disappearing yeah. microbes or microbiome, what is, what is, how is it disappearing? What does that mean? Well, uh, about 30 years ago, I began studying a bacteria that lives in the human stomach that's called Helicobacter pylori. And it was first discovered in the 19th century when probably everybody had it. There's evidence that supports that. And when it was rediscovered and finally isolated in pure culture in the late 20th century, by that time, maybe half the people in developed countries had it. And it became clear that people used to have it, and now people have it less. And as I began studying it, I began to understand that this was actually a normal organism in the human body, and that was disappearing. And that was kind of a new idea, because microbes in the human body aren't supposed to disappear. No one had really thought about that kind of issue. But it became clear that that was disappearing. And then I thought if one organism is disappearing, maybe others are disappearing as well. And that's, it's now clear that that's correct. And, and is there an argument as to why these microbes are disappearing? One of the factors is clearly antibiotics. And that's why my book has that subtitle, How the Overuse of Antibiotics. But that's not the only factor. In fact, the disappearance of Helicobacter probably began before the discovery of antibiotics. Hmm. So there are other factors. It might be sanitation and clean water. The clean water is a tremendous boon to humankind, but it may have uh, unexpected consequences. You mentioned antibiotics and the overuse of antibiotics, claimed overuse. You, you know, there's another factor, and that's cesarean sections. Uh -huh. <clears throat> because when babies are born naturally, they're covered with their mom's microbes. Uh, but when they're born by C-section, they, they miss that passage through the birth canal, and they get very extensive doses of antibiotics as well. And in the United States today, one baby out of three is born by C-section. C-section has become the new norm. And, and so there's evidence that the microbiome is initially is different when kids are born by C-section, and we found evidence that, that different, some of those differences can be seen after a year still after a year. And that's a very critical period of the development of babies. If I were to ask you in the briefest way possible to say what's the greatest danger, what scares you the most, what, I mean, should we worry about this? What, what should we be worried about? The thing I'm really worried about is featured in chapter 15 of my book. It's called Antibiotic Winter. Yeah. And in fact, I was going to, I wanted to title the book Antibiotic Winter because that's what I'm really afraid of. Uh, and that is, uh, it's, it's the fear of a plague. Why has asthma 
increased so dramatically in the last 50 years? Why has obesity, why is obesity skyrocketing around the world? <clears throat> why is there celiac disease? Why is there more autism? We, we have all these diseases that have suddenly taken a big turn up, really in the period after World War II, which is also the period when antibiotics have been deployed. And my theory, the theory of missing microbes, is that that's what's driving them. You know, when, when the Black Death came to Europe in the 14th century, it killed about a quarter of the people. And if you look back in human history, there have been many plagues. It's not, that, that was not an isolated event. And one of the things that we know as microbiologists is that the normal bacteria help protect against invaders. And so we're degrading our defenses. We're, we're degrading our uh, normal defenses. And as I, as I point out in the book in some experimental studies that were done in the 1950s, it was shown that it takes a certain number of salmonella to kill a mouse. But if you pre-treat them with antibiotics, it takes 100,000 times fewer bacteria to kill the mouse. And that's just an example of how important our microbes are in our defense against invaders. And is, is this change in the microbiome that potentially is leading to these modern plagues, is this something that can be treated medically case by case? Or is it um, something that has to be uh, addressed on a systematic environmental level? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, right now, uh, uh, our approaches to treating it on a case-by-case -case basis are very limited. Very limited. Maybe one day we will have better case-by-case -case answers. I'm hopeful that science will provide those answers. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, first we have to understand what the problem is. And if the problem is decreasing diversity and loss of microbes, then we have to have, figure out a way to get them back to reverse the microbes. It's not going to happen. It, if we stopped all the antibiotics tomorrow, which I am not advocating, by the way, uh, we would still be down here. Uh, we have to figure out how to get back up. One of the things you say in the book is that the average child, I don't know if it's in the United States or in the developed world, has three courses of antibiotics before they're two years old. That, that's data from the U.S. From the U.S. And that's true, but, but one of the things that's very interesting about antibiotics is how much variation there is in the use of antibiotics that cannot be explained by variation in disease. So in, some, in the South, for example, they use 50% more antibiotics than they do in the West, but there isn't... The South of the United States yes, versus the West of the United that's States. Right, 50% more. In Greece... Uh, and in Italy, they're using twice as much antibiotics as they're using in Scandinavia per capita. So there are different cultural and medical issues of practice. Now, in some developing countries, what might seem paradoxical is that antibiotic use is even greater. Uh, in many places, antibiotics are available without prescription. So parents are concerned about the health of their kids. The child has a fever. They go to the pharmacist who's happy to sell them an antibiotic. There are some studies that were funded by the Gates Foundations where kids are getting, in their first year of life, 10 courses of antibiotics on average. And what's the, da you know, let's, I have children, they've had antibiotics. What's the danger of having antibiotics, giving antibiotics to our children? Well, it's becoming clear that an altered microbiome early in life is a risk factor for the development of obesity, for the development of asthma inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease. It, it's increasing the risk that these things will happen. I think that every time a child takes an antibiotic, that there's some small increase in their risk that they're going to get one of these diseases. And in what way does your research seek to um, save us or prevent what you call a antibiotic winter or microbial yeah. winter from emerging? Well, I, I think there are two points. The first is to provide evidence that, that these ideas that I'm saying are actually correct, that, that actually the change in the microbiome is fueling these diseases. So that's an educational component. But, yes, but, but, but people, you know, theories arise all the time. And the question is, can we, can we show this convincingly so that we will change our practices, so that we can then 
uh, use antibiotics much less. Mm -hmm. Maybe figure out ways to reduce the degradation of our microbiome, re re reduce the antibacterials in our food that are that are used to improve shelf life in the super in, in the grocery store. But those antibacterial, we're ingesting them. So, so there there are ways that we can decrease the damage. That's very important. And then. The other aspect is to figure out, now, how can we get things back? How can we begin to restore? And what's the right age to restore? And what are the right organisms? Or maybe they are particular families, consortia of organisms, or, or chemical products, uh, w which are called prebiotics, which are useful to encourage the, the growth of certain beneficial organisms. So th there are many opportunities. and and. One other aspect of this is, is something that my wife thought about, uh, which is called the microbiota vault. So, um, microbiota vault. So, about 30 years ago, uh, a group of scientists developed something called the seed vault to create, to say, to preserve all the seeds of humankind against catastrophic events. And so, there's a vault up in the Norwegian Arctic in Svalbard, where seeds from all over the world. Are, are being stored just in case for for posterity because we're losing biodiversity in the, on the farm too and so we want to do the same thing we want to have a microbiota vault one or more microbiota vaults to preserve microbial diversity so that if there's a time that we need to get it back we will have it otherwise it, it, it will be extinct um, a lot of my students are very aware of now global warming. It's become a, a big political issue. Not so aware of the microbiome. In your mind, are they of equal importance? Is one more important than the other? Which, if I'm a young person interested in saving the world or changing the world, should I be focusing on global warming or the microbiome? Uh, you know, I, I've thought about global warming a lot. and. Uh, 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 you, we could define global warming as a change in our macroecology due to human processes. And this disappearing microbiota is a change in our microecology due to human processes. They're somewhat parallel. Unfortunately, it's happening on a faster time frame. So global warming is clearly a problem. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a problem, especially in 100 years or 200 years. Uh, but I, I'm worried about 20 years from now, 40 years from now. And if a, if, a, if a young person, college student, is interested in getting involved in this, you know, what, did, what does one do? Yeah. Well, on the individual level, people can try to make health decisions to conserve their microbiome and conserve the microbiome of the family members, just such as telling the doctor, I, I only want antibiotics when absolutely necessary. Sometimes doctors think that the patients want the antibiotics. Some, some people come and say, you know, I don't feel well, give me an antibiotic. The doctor's under pressure to do so. So uh, certainly we can change our attitudes and, and we can try to avoid antibacterials in our foods. But then... Uh, then we need more research. We have to understand uh, exactly what the problem is and how we're going to turn it around. And and just as we were able to use science to have somebody walk on the moon, we, we can solve the problem, but we, we have to work on it in a systematic manner. So if there were one final thought you wanted to leave people with about why they should worry and what they should think about the microbiome and the disappearing microbes, what would that be? Well, first, I'm glad you're having this conference. Thank you. It's a good. It's a good. It's a good topic to improve people's awareness. I think. I think that's great. Uh, I think we need to understand the problem, and based on that understanding, find solutions. The vault is one solution. We encourage people. You can look at our website, microbiotavault.org, uh, and uh, we're always happy to get contributions as well uh, to further that work, uh, and. Uh, I guess uh, the the use of antibiotics in some ways is a uh, is is kind of a paradigm for many things in our 
in our medical ecology where we're overusing many things that are driven by other, like, like, like cesarean sections, which have, have kind of gone through the roof. So we, we, have to, we have to use things taking into account that they're not free. One question just that I think a lot of my students will be interested in is a lot of them drink kombucha, right? Uh, probiotics. Is that helpful in restoring or preserving a healthy microbiome in your gut? Whether there really are health effects or not, I'm not sure. Uh, and and uh, if you go to the supermarket or the health food store or the pharmacy, uh, you will see uh, hundreds of products that are labeled as probiotics. And they are extremely variable. Some of them, the bacteria aren't even alive. It's, it's a really kind of wild west out there. And uh, they're almost entirely untested, despite the, the vague kind of claims that are on the bottles. Just one question I want to make sure I get in. This is a question we're going to be asking all the people at the conferences. What is the most meaningful thing you have done in your life? It's not your typical question, I know. Mm -hmm. What's the most meaningful thing I've done in my life? Well, biologically, it's to have children. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I'm a biologist. Right. So, um, uh, but this, this work about about the, the, the disappearing microbiota uh, is the most important work of my professional career because it, it impacts all of us. It, you know, it's not that I've done work on certain infections and other things, but th this is affecting all of us and it's affecting future generations. Okay, great. Thank you very much for speaking with yeah, us. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I wish you could be with us at the conference. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Great. I will be there in spirit. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.